Is this on? Yeah, it is. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started here because there's a lot to cover and so I'm sure that we will want to use all of the time. Um, I am Kira Allman, I'm from the University of Oxford and I'm chairing this panel. Um, I do a lot of research with community networks and that's why I'm here. But uh, I will not be doing most of the talking, I'm just going to use chair's privilege to set the scene and introduce the panel and some of the themes that we're talking about and then I'm going to hand it over to our panelists. So just to give a little bit of framing of the session today, um, we are all here to talk about inclusivity and diversity in community networks um, and actually also in communications networks more broadly um, and so I think it's important to just establish what community networks are so what are we talking about in this room um, you're probably here because you already know the answer to that question that's why you're interested in this session um, and our panelists today are going to also help add some detail and specificity to that definition what are community networks and why are they important to this conversation but just to make sure that we have some clarity before we get started, um, we are talking about autonomous connectivity solutions at the community level. So this often means that communities build, own, and operate their own network infrastructure locally. So that's what we mean by community networks. Um, so why do they matter? Um, well, uh, sorry, well, commercial networks are only expected to connect around 60 to 70 percent of the world's population by 2025. So the UN Sustainable Development Goal of Universal Internet Access by 2030 is pretty far out of reach at this point. So in short, using current strategies, the connectivity needs of billions of people, especially in developing countries, but not only, uh, will not be met. In response to that situation, communities around the world have been exploring options for connecting themselves, and we need to treat those community initiatives as integral parts of the overall internet ecosystem. So that's why we're all here. Apart from offering alternative technological and economic models for connectivity, community networks also help us to focus in new ways on some of the inclusivity challenges that face all kinds of communications, technologies, and networks. So as this panel will discuss, they still face gender-based discrimination, for instance. Com community networks can be radical alternative solutions to hegemonic telecommunications ownership structures, but they may also still be spaces of access where male hegemony and patriarchy exclude women, LGBTQI, trans, and gender diverse people from playing an active role in the network, so we need to be aware of that. At the same time, they may also be sites of resistance to these dominant social structures and they may provide new pathways for greater equality. So community networks are also much more complex than just infrastructure and they're a lot richer in many ways than incumbent commercial telecommunications infrastructure. So they support the creation of social bonds, they foster local economies, they encourage skill building, and they increase access to knowledge, of course. And they transform and are transformed by the social relationships of the place where they are physically rooted. So this year's IGF theme is One World, One Net, one vision and at the wonderful uh, Association for Progressive Communications Disco Tech last night we heard some speakers challenge this slogan a little bit um, is it flattening or homogenizing this space for innovation that has always been diverse and contested where is the space for alternative connectivity solutions or models that challenge the dominant ownership paradigms or gender norms in one net for the entire world there is power in universality, yes, definitely, but there's also empowerment in specificity. So we're going to try to engage with some of those tensions here as we focus on policy recommendations that have emerged from lived experiences working in and with community networks. So there are essentially two areas of recommendation that can come out of this session. 
First, on the one hand, there are recommendations for community networks themselves about how we can build a collaborative movement that is more inclusive and gender aware. And then on the other hand, there are also recommendations for all network operators and all networks that we can make here on this panel because we are informed by local cases. So in other words, we'll talk about what community networks can teach us about networks in general. And I'll encourage the panelists to frame their insights as we go in terms of those two kinds of recommendations so we can be kind of clear about that. So we have a panel here who are mothers of community networks, uh, they're community networks builders, they're leaders, researchers, fundraisers, and advocates. And I'm now going to let them introduce themselves. And then I'll ask some general questions to the panel to help guide the conversation. And I'm going to be fairly strict about timing so that we can hear as many different perspectives as possible. So I hope no one will be too offended if I interrupt you at some point in order to move the conversation along. But let's start with introductions. And we'll start over here maybe with uh, Sarbani, if that's okay. And I'll just give you each about five minutes to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about the communities that you've worked with, worked with and in. So where are you coming from to this conversation? And uh, what's your experience uh, with gender that's relevant to this, this panel? So if you can cram that all into five minutes, that would be great. So we'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Kira. I'm Sharbani Belur, uh, working as a senior research scientist at Grammarg um, Department of Electrical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, I have been working in this project for the past five years, and the project in itself uh, is conceived uh, in the year 2012. So it is, it is there since 2012. Uh, initially, we focused only on technology intervention for connectivity, but uh, slowly we went into deeper and deeper into understanding that is connectivity being used by the people? Uh, can it be made sustainable? Um, what are the ways by which connectivity can be made sustainable within the communities? And uh, can the community start owning the network on their own or form a community network by themselves? So this is, uh, so I, we have been working now in 34 villages in Palghar, uh, which is like uh, three hours drive from Mumbai and um, not very far from Mumbai, but yet there are villages that are completely unconnected. Um, in these villages that I work on, I not only enable uh, uh, connectivity over there, but also try to make it um, very inclusive. Like uh, in in uh, in one of the in, our, in one of our projects, what I found is that the connectivity being used mostly by men and not by women, and trying to understand that why why the women in these villages were not using the connectivity after we have enabled it to them. Um, so some of the things that they have mentioned is that uh, the access points were not accessible to them in the evening after day after it uh, becomes dark. So we tried to make uh, women-friendly access points. The second thing that they want mentioned to us is that um, yeah, there is no content for them in the in the in the internet. And uh, but I was completely surprised to understand to know that because there is a lot of content, but they told that some of the contents that we watch on the internet is not approved by our uh, by the male members in the family because sometimes it is related to women problems women physical problems issues related to childbirth and um, uh, reproductive health issues so so these are the things that so we try to come up with these uh, the different barriers and try to focus on working with the women. We also work with women entrepreneurs to understand how connectivity is being used by the women in these villages. Um, can you hear me? Is that? Yeah. Uh, Nicola Bidwell, I uh, live in uh, Namibia. I'm associated with various institutions. Um, so I'm a, a woman technologist, um, kind of a grandmother of kinds, or perhaps grand aunt of uh, community networks. Um, and I'm an academic in the field of HCI who spent um, much of my time in the past uh, dozen years uh, living extensively in rural communities, mostly in southern Africa, uh, where I, my work is like practice-based 
participatory ethnographic approach. So in 2008, um, I lived in Eastern Cape, South Africa, and um, tried to put up with some colleagues a Wi-Fi between some traditional headmen. Um, and then between 2010 and 2013, um, after that wasn't terribly successful, um, started an offline social network, content, media sharing, solar, uh, solar-powered uh, station, um, also living in the village um, to do that, which is a long way from uh, any major centre. Um, towards the end of that time, um, Carlos Rey Moreno came and um, I learnt the term community network. So um, he seeded a, a Wi-Fi network with the same uh, people who I've been doing the uh, content sharing for. In 2016, I increased my education about community networks um, when uh, Carlos uh, brought the first African summit for community networks to a conference I founded in Nairobi, and that's when I met Josephine for the first time. Um, so since then, I've um, tried to be a great aunt uh, to uh, various community networks in Namibia um, with varying degrees of success. Um, one in my, a village right next to my home, um, south of Wintook in the bush, which uh, is uh, supported by ISOC, and AFCHIX, which is um, a women in technology uh, organization across Africa. Um, and now recently um, in the Kalahari with uh, the San people funded by an APC seed project. Um, since the end of 2017 to uh, the beginning of this year, I also worked with Mike Jensen, uh, funded by the APC and IDRC, on looking at um, the social and gender impacts in community networks. Um, and I focused on six cases, two in each continent in the global south, um, and I'll come to, to what I learnt about that when we get uh, asked further questions. Um, and I'm also, um, in order to pay my bills, uh, it, uh, doing some work with the University of Cork on community radio in remote islands off the coast of Ireland, um, not all of which have the internet. So um, these are uh, my experiences in this area. Hello, my name is Josephine Meliza, and I am the Africa Regional Coordinator for the APC LockNet project, and also a champion for community networks in Africa, having initiated a community network in uh, Kenya, a place called uh, Kibera, and it's called Tunapandanet. Uh, my journey in community networks started in 2016, when I joined uh, Tunapanda Institute, and uh, found that uh, they were interested in starting a wireless project, but had uh, very little experience around how to do the work. And around that time, I was privileged to go to Italy at the ICTP, and I'm happy to see Hermano and Marco in the room. And they're the ones who introduced me to the world of community networks. Because at the time when we started, we didn't even know what we were doing. We just knew we wanted a wireless project uh, to connect the community. So uh, from there, I learned about Giffinet and was able to read a lot of research uh, that they had done around it, and also with the help of Hermano and uh, Marco, just knowing how to do a configuration with uh, ubiquity equipment, since the ones that had previously been donated to us, uh, we had fried them as we tried to, to work around them. So uh, being that I am a network engineer, my like knowledge around it was really framed around like technology is the end uh, to all challenges, but we quickly realized that um, there's a lot of human aspects that uh, goes into, into networking, and it's not just about uh, good infrastructure, but it's also really, really important to meaningful access. So to date, uh, we are supported, uh, Tunapandanet is supported by the Internet Society, and we have been able to connect 15 centers, among them are schools, our youth and women's centers, and I'm also privileged uh, to continue my work in community networks, working with APC and supporting four community networks in Africa, uh, that being Zenzeleni, um, Bosco, Uganda, CYD in Malawi, and Pamojanet in DRC. Uh, 
My experiences around gender are first that I'm an African woman and uh, being raised uh, in rural areas, I got to really understand uh, the dynamics of uh, the challenges that uh, women face. And one thing that really inspired me was my mom because the first, and also other mothers in the community, is that first and foremost, their purpose is that their children and their families are safe. So even in thinking about technology, I was very informed that technology, when we go to women, it's not just about uh, internet is fun to use, you can be able to access so many opportunities, but really how does it translate to a good life for their children and also a good life for their family as well. So as uh, Tunapandanet, we have done a work around uh, training uh, women on ICTs, we do, uh, training on the relevance on how ICTs can be able to amplify women's voices around uh, political issues, but also just uh, sharing with the world what they do and improving uh, their economic uh, sustainability in the community as well. So I'm happy to be in the panel today and looking forward to share more on my experiences. Hello, this is Valeria Betancourt from the Association for Progressive Communications. I manage the policy program in the APC. I am Ecuadorian. Um, and let me first tell you a little bit about the APC. The APC is a global organization and network uh, that works towards enabling conditions for all people to have um, easy and affordable access uh, to, to ICTs, to, to the internet an internet that is open and free in order to improve the life of, of people and, and work, um, work towards uh, social justice. Uh, you have been hearing a lot about the LockNet project. Uh, this is a, a, a project, a collaborative project um, being hosted by the APC and uh, implemented with the collaboration of Rizomatica uh, and ISOC. Uh, and the project um, is our attempt to contribute to create an enabling environment that uh, would allow the, the community networks to flourish, to, em to emerge, to sustain themselves. And um, it has a focus on developing countries. Uh, it is a multi-year, multi-donor strategy initiative uh, that through, a human through the creation of human capacity and also addressing uh, sustainability challenges are um, trying to contribute, as I was saying, to create a, mo a more favorable conditions for community networks to not only be created but also to, to, to grow and, and, and um, a scale. Um, uh, the project is uh, through peer learning, through capacity building, through raising awareness, uh, addressing the different type of challenges that community networks have been facing, not only at the level of, of uh, the technological dimension, but also sustainability challenges, uh, governance challenges, social challenges. And um, it's also contributing this project to identify what are the conditions at the regulatory and, and public policy context that might enable these networks to um, be established and also to um, optimize their existence in order to uh, meet the requirements and the needs of the social context in which they, in which they exist. Uh, the project uh, focuses on 12 community networks in different regions, Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, and here we, we have uh, some of the regional coordinators. Um, unfortunately, the coordinator for Latin America could not come, so I will try to transmit some, uh, something about what is going on in the Latin American region in particular in this panel. Um, uh, but the, uh, these 12 community networks are um, part of this core um, group of communities that are contributing to the strengthening of the community networks movement uh, and to uh, advocating for expanding um, support and consciousness uh, about, about the potential that this uh, model, this way of actually contributing uh, to achieve digital inclusion um, uh, has. So I would be happy to tell you a little bit more afterwards about the Latin American experience in particular, but wanted to tell you a little bit more about the, the, the project as a such.
Thank you very much. My name is Jane Coffin. I work for the Internet Society, or ISOC, or ISOC. I think I've worked with almost everybody on this table and also around the table here. Um, this is my colleague Sebastian Belagamba. We are partners in crime working together on community networks, um, sort of leading the teams inside the Internet Society, but trying not to, quote, lead in the field, but take advice from people who want us to come in, help work with them on sustainability training, as Valeria has said, with regulatory policy. So it's tech, development, policy, regulatory, and other. Um, the projects are around the world, from Latin America to North America, quite frankly, with indigenous communities, where we've had a lot of success and surprising uptake and traction. Matt Rentanen from one of the um, tribal communities in the United States is here today and he can tell you more about some great projects that we've been working on with him and others. But this is about local empowerment changing the way we look at embedded regulatory policy and other infrastructure. I, we have a keen, keen appreciation for trying to gently work with as many stakeholders as possible. That means whether it's government, whether it's um, different UN organizations, to change mindsets because the old regulatory telco mindset, I used to work for a telco, so I can say this, I understand it, but it has to change because I've been doing this for 20 years and the unconnected are still unconnected. <laughs> so, and I also want to acknowledge Hermano and Marco Zanaro who are with ICTP, also colleagues of ours. I think from the gender side, I don't want to overshadow what the others have said and just say that particularly when I'm negotiating with some men in the UN system, I have found that I often do have to take a step back and figure out how to deal with them. <laughs> because sometimes they think I'm just coming in from an emotional perspective, and I'm not. I'm a pretty logical person, but I do find myself amazed at how many times I do have to over-explain why this is important and what we're doing. And I don't often think about this as a gender thing, but I, I'm realizing it is. So it's not a complaint, it's just a fact. But um, we move on and we have lots of people inside the organization that work on these issues. But the key thing is, is we never wanna be a single point of failure. The critical issue is local, local training where local people are empowered to build the network, sustain the networks and find new solutions. And we don't go anywhere where we're not asked to go. So the key thing is to listen. Um, you can't go to places and say that you know because you don't live there. So the critical thing is where we can work with our local teams to uh, create local change. Great, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists for your introductions. Um, that's great. Um, something we'll return to and a note that, um, that Jane just ended the introductions on is this issue of, of code switching that we all do a lot between um, the local level where many of us work uh, as, as researchers or organizers or activists and, uh, and this kind of forum, sort of a multi-stakeholder policy forum, it requires that we use different language and a different kind of vernacular and uh, there are, there's an important gendered perspective, gender lens that we can bring to that as well. So I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that and we will return to that in, in the questions today. So the first question that I'd like to pose to the panel um, is a, kind of a broad policy question. Um, what are the factors that affect gender inclusion based on your own personal experience working with community networks? What are the factors that affect gender inclusion um, that community networks networks reveal that might be hidden otherwise in uh, commercial telecommunications solutions to connectivity more generally? What perspective does that community network lens give us? So um, I'm actually going to change up the order a little bit so that not it's, it, we don't put everybody in the hot seat in the exact same order. So um, I'd, I'm wondering if Josephine, perhaps you could, you could start us off with that question. Uh, thank you, Kira. The first thing I would say is um, the hidden figures. We do not know how many women are connected and how many women are unconnected. And so what you find in most of the reporting around connectivity, uh, the data is actually gotten from telecoms. So in our context, for example, the data is gotten from telecoms and it is as 
the number of smartphones that uh, have been purchased. So that is what uh, we use to translate that, uh, for example, 70% of our population is connected or 80% uh, of our population is connected. So, and this brings another aspect around um, the economic dependence in that uh, for most uh, of the areas, so in Africa, and I'll bring this back to the Kenyan context and Kibera, uh, where most of my experiences have been, is that uh, women are mostly economically dependent on, on the male uh, or the, on the men. And so there's uh, gender wage gaps and also the uh, financial constraints. So women are not able to afford uh, access uh, in terms of the devices, but also in terms of um, getting the data bundles to, uh, to, to be able to get access. Another issue is around isolation. And so from, if you're not able to get access through a mobile phone, then it means that you would go to a cyber cafe or a computer center to get this. But in most of the instances, these uh, spaces are male dominated. And culturally, it's, it's not uh, good for a woman to, to go into that space because sometimes you're told that uh, you have bad manners. Or <laughs> the other aspect is the fear of sexual harassment because you get into a space that uh, the cyber cafe sometimes are very, very tiny and it's male dominated. So you really don't feel safe to go into there as a woman. Also, uh, issues around um, the household duties that women have to do. Uh, when are these uh, computer centers open? And how does it affect if I'm supposed to cook lunch? Uh, if I'm supposed to do household chores, then what time do I have uh, to go to the center? So isolation also plays a role. Then my last point is around a lack of relevant content and platforms. Uh, technology is not neutral, and so creators order the purpose and um, that it will, it will play. And we find that uh, there are very few women who are participating in the development of technologies. And so from just the content that is online, uh, also to the application, they are not really relevant to what women or to address women issues and interests, and it relates to the point that uh, Sabani also shares. So these, I think, are some of the blind spots that miss in, in the policy. Yes. Great, thanks, Josephine. Nick, would you like to speak next? Uh, yes, yeah, so adding on to Josephine's uh, tech is not neutral, um, one of the things that came through very clearly in the research that I did with the community, uh, social and gender impact is um, what this means for Wi-Fi. So uh, as Josephine mentioned, you're trying to manage um, going to the farm and your housework and then nipping into uh, to somewhere near to the access point. Um, so uh, Wi-Fi range um, and uh, traffic shaping of um, Wi-Fi um, hotspots uh, is uh, a gendered, uh, has a gendered effect when it comes into contact with people's lifestyles. Uh, so if your network engineers are not women, um, you have a complete blind spot about what range what um, might actually mean um, and that go and that was seen over and over again in in my res research it also has this tension with uh, somebody who's living in a rural area and managing these things um, and somebody who lives most of their life at 35,000 feet and occasionally drops into um, a pol to chat with policy um, policy people um, and this is not a, a blame of them this is how we embody um, and understand through our lived experience so the other point that I think is um, it um, community networks can reveal um, is how we are in, in, in rightly focusing on the youth we are also um, cutting out older women um, Time and again in the communities, the, the older women were the backbone. They were doing much of the work, 
that wasn't to say the younger women weren't, but what was also happening to the older women would be doing a huge amount of the work to maintain the community, but without any decision-making power or uh, any um, use of the technology. And that has um, a long-term sustainability issue. So one uh, consequence was that of that was sometimes the younger women would sort of say, well, to hell with this community, net this patriarchal community network. I'm going to go off and set up a franchise for the local network op operator. So this creates a disjunction between older and younger women, which in rural communities is, is quite um, disastrous. Um, so I'd also like to mention in that point some work by Tigist um, Shawaga Hosan, who also uh, noticed the invisibility of women's work. So they may not use the use a, use a network, and this can actually affect all kinds of technology activities, not just community networks. They may be doing an awful lot to get people's phones charged and have very few of the benefits at the same time. So, um, sadly, very undecided work, which is um, one of our problems, that people, are, women are noticing these things, researchers are noticing these things, and they continue to be, that research continues to be ignored. Um, so the final thing that I'd like to bring up is this kind of fetishist or uh, of the business model focus, um, and, and what, meaningful connectivity means with that. Meaningful connectivity uh, for many people, men and women, is about family, belonging. Um, it's, it is, might be about income, but it's a, about a whole spectrum of other things that make us human. And these type of things are coming into more, um, are becoming more obvious when we realize that our grow, economic growth models are um, killing us and killing our planet. Um, so um, this really came uh, into my mind a lot uh, a couple of weeks ago when I'm working with um, sand people in the Kalahari. And I'm thinking to myself, why the hell am I bringing in plastic into this environment? What does it really mean to these people who are coping with a 90-year drought that will probably kill lots of them? What does it really mean um, when we are thinking only in terms of the relationship between connectivity and um, economics in a financial sense? Um, don't we need to think a little bit more widely? And I think community networks can bring out some of those things because they, you engage with people. It isn't something distant. This is people that you talk to and you see with their, you know, making their ostrich beads, looking after their children. And um, it touches something that probably um, Jane would be accused of as illogical. But this isn't illogical, this is human. Great, thanks, Nick. Sarbani? Um, I would like to say that um, community networks contribute to connectivity with a meaning. And I think um, what we see in our villages currently with the APC project uh, that uh, we are currently doing uh, is that uh, some of the things that the women were originally doing earlier, uh, men have taken over. Like um, in the indigenous community that with, uh, with whom I work now, currently, uh, used to draw this painting, this special type of painting that is called the Varli painting. And these are paintings that were done originally by women, only by women. And, uh, but over time, what has happened is that women have, uh, women are sort of not doing it anymore. It's only the men. And the reason why the community say is that the women in the community say is that men are more enterprising than women. So it, it has become, so I think community networks, what we see in our community networks is that it brings in a lot of meaning to the community when we understand it from the women's perspective. And um, like for example, um, in the location where we work, indigenous communities where we work, has a lot of malnutrition problem. Children are underweight, there are, there are malnourished pregnant mothers. Now they don't even know 
they don't even know what is what is the type of breastfeeding practices that they have to do because if they watch it on the internet it is considered not good by the men so they can't go into certain of these websites to look into best pre, uh, the best practices for breastfeeding or complementary feeding for kids for the children underweight children so so these so uh, so what our community network what the connectivity that is enabled is not an online connectivity but an offline connectivity with lots of resources for the peop for the women uh, in the community in their own language so it's not an english or something it is in in their own language marathi language which they access it at a time when they feel it is like so they are not dependent on data they are not dependent on having a smartphone so they can watch that and it is also being facilitated by the health workers the the women health workers in the community so i think we we do we do we do understand it from a perspective that it adds a lot of meaning to connectivity i think the meaning is currently lost in that connectivity journey of ours and i think that is very important the other thing that the connectivity community networks can bring in by focusing on women is also on the sustainability part because we we looked into what women use when they are having the data and what men use it for and we see that women often use it for homework for guiding uh, guiding their children in their homework or getting some whatsapp message from the teacher in the school um so these are the things that the women do but it's not that i'm bashing men here but it's just that the it's just that the women think about it from a sustainable point of view in the sense that okay how much of electricity when we put in the tower over there in the village the the women led uh, uh, village headman in those villages the first question that the the headman of the village asks is that how much would the electricity be consumed how much does the electric how much does your how much electricity does it consume um who is going to maintain the tower are you going to come and look into it every time or are we going to but in the villages where there were no where, uh, it was a male dom a male uh, headman's uh, village so they told that okay you are uh, free to put up the tower here in in the location where the local self government offices so i think i think that part is like both meaning and sustainability to, to the community network is true um uh, yeah in um, connectivity being meaningful and sustainable great thanks sarbani valeria would yes. you like to okay so um i will try to transmit you the the experience of uh, carla velasco lilian chamorro the ones who are doing the work in latin america directly with community Uh, networks not only working with with women in the communities to um, understand and unpack a little bit more the in the differential impact that um, telecommunications and the same community networks have in the life of women but also they have been trying to facilitate inclusion of women in uh, specific um, processes including policy and regulatory processes uh, and as well um, Uh, facilitating processes within the community in order to create safe spaces for women to to be able to not only strengthen their capacities to manage and 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 to be part of the decisions around the establishment of community networks in 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 the field so in in their experience what they have found as the main aspects that uh, uh, or the factors that affect gender uh, inclusion in the communities is the fact that uh, as 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 nick was pointing out the invisibility of women's work and the disregard of of the roles that uh, that are the basis for many of the initiatives at the community level and that are not necessarily technical but are the basis of actually sustaining many of the community dynamics and have to do with women assuming different type of roles uh, the administrative side uh, drivers they, they they are caregivers they play 
differ different roles, and sometimes themselves are not even aware of the importance of, of the roles that they are playing. So uh, the result is that those roles are not recognized within or outside the communities. Um, so um, the women working in Latin America have also uh, identified the lack of safe spaces within and outside the communities as one of the factors that inhibit um, their full you know, engagement and, in, and in inclusion in these spaces. Because it, 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 is that it does not only tra translate in the lack of possibility for them to meaningfully um, uh, devise the interventions at the community level, but also to be part of decision making that affects their lives and the lives of the, of the communities. Carla, for instance, Carla Velasco, who is very active in ITU spaces, she has referred that, for instance, in those spaces, and, and not only on those spaces, but particularly on those spaces, uh, it's clearly manifested the fact that technology is usually associated with um, masculine factors and with power. So those spaces are not welcoming, are not... Um, um, friendly are discriminatory for women, not only because of the codes that um, are, are established on those spaces, the language that is used, the terminology, but also even things that we might think are not important, but uh, are important at the end of the day, which are dress codes, for instance. So I, I never forget when Carla was uh, telling us um, at some point that in one of these ITU CTEL meetings, for instance, um, when, when they are getting prepared for having uh, conversations about the regulatory and policy conditions in, in the region, uh, usually when uh, the moment gets to identify who is going to do the note-taking um, uh, role or exercise to take that role, they usually turn to look at the women in the room because it is assumed by default that this is the role that they have in those type of di dialogues rather than you know, assuming that they are enough um, knowledgeable to be able to contribute meaningfully or substantially to, to the discussion. So the roles of women are sometimes limited to what is uh, established as the, as the norm of, or, or the stereotype around that. Um, other factor has to do with, uh, uh, there is still a lot to do in, in order to break some ideas that put women in the side of being fragile, not, be, not uh, being able to engage, you know, uh, in, in hard terms with the technology, not only in terms of uh, what is needed uh, to, to deploy, infrastructure, I mean concretely, but also in, in, ter in terms of understanding what the technology is for. So those are some of the factors that have been identified in the Latin American uh, context in which uh, the project is operating. I'm only laughing because when I first started doing um, projects in other countries, when I was living in country and this was interesting to me, as, and Valeria just mentioned it, that when people heard that I was in technology, um, telco networks at that time, and other wireless networks, they immediately thought I was a spy. Because God forbid a woman actually knows something about technology. But I got over that fact that they thought I was a spy. And we kept going forward. Um, I think the key thing is you just have to break down these barriers to what people assume you're doing. and. I would be disingenuous if I said I actually knew what it was like in some of these places that we're talking about. So like Valeria, I can give you examples. But I think the thing that has been most useful that we've been doing is supporting the women who are working in these communities. And just being there as a person that will listen to what they have to say and just continuing to push and give them hope and funding where we can or other perspectives on how a community network can change things in their community. Um, one other observation is that community networks, when you're talking about small towns, and I'm from a very small town in the United States, um, people have to do, they just have to get things done. And so often there is, sometimes gender will break down as far as just getting the job done. It depends on where you're from. It depends on obviously on the culture and the community, but it really is, as I think Carla found out on dress and, and how people um, perceive you when you come in, 
is that you, you have to take a step back as someone that's working with a community around the world, just depends on where you are, and not assume that you know. You've got to listen again to what people have to say and take their lead. And you may have to step back, they may want you to step forward, but I think the most important thing is not assuming you know. Um, and bringing in Western culture to some places can be very dangerous. And so you've, and from, because I am from a Western culture, and I think you do have to, I've learned so much over time that sometimes I'm oblivious to it. And I do have to take a step back in every country that I go into. Um, sometimes I do have to take a different role because if you're a female coming into a, a certain type of environment and you push too hard, you will not get what you need done. So it's very difficult on occasion to be quiet, <laughs> for me, obviously, or to just try and figure out where you fit. And, it, and it's different from tribal cultures to talking to a head person in a village, but you do have to be sensitive to it and not assume that you can come in and change their world, because that's not what you want to do. You want to provide tools. It's, not, it, it's a very delicate balance, I think. Thank you to all the panelists for their contributions on that question. To build on those insights, which kind of give an overview of um, some of the important takeaways that we have uh, from experience with community networks on issues related to gender, let's um, talk a little bit about the what are the things that actually actively allow for inclusion of women, uh, queer, trans, gender diverse people. What have we seen on the ground that actually works in terms of promoting inclusivity. Um, and uh, maybe let's start again over at the end with, uh, with Sarbani. And also, to all the panelists, don't feel like you have to answer every question, but you have the opportunity to if you want to. Uh, in our community network, um, uh, with the APC project currently ongoing, uh, we tried to work together with the women uh, by uh, women preserving their local knowledge. So I think uh, that's something that uh, the women, um, they, they, they think that that is their domain, that used to be their domain, that is no more their domain, and they feel that they can contribute a lot to it uh, by, uh, uh, by so, so we have set up access points, so we have set up Raspberry Pis within the village, uh, and uh, they share content in that, in that Raspberry Pi. So the content is like local knowledge, audio-based or video-based uh, local knowledge that is shared within the community by the women. And I think um, that also is sort of a, uh, they also realize that they can contribute because till now the, the connectivity uh, journey of mine, enabling connectivity to the villages has been that women say that I can't contribute because I don't know what is that technical. Then I try to be, I try to tell them that look, I am also not from a technical background. I am from a, uh, from a demography or sociology background. So you don't need to be a technologist to understand technology. But so, so meaningfulness, when we start attributing that connectivity has some meaning in their lives and how they can use it for their everyday life. Like for example, uh, we now currently, they don't use anything else. So they just, entire day, they are focusing on um, collecting local knowledge. So local knowledge on trees, fruits, recipes, uh, with the, the different types of uh, vegetables that are available during the monsoon season, and uh, various types of art and craft. So everything is local that is there with them. They are contributing to that. Uh, okay, so um, uh, encourage a re reflective position. Um, one, one community network that stood out in my case studies was Ultramundi. Um, was very self-critical um, and very um, thought quite a lot about women's inclusion and did and did very well compared to a lot of the other community networks in women women's inclusion um, and had long discussions about uh, balancing childcare um, and and those type of things um, 
Uh, so also the timing of activities. If you're doing some capacity building um, and you're deciding where you're going to put the server or um, the computer that you're going to look at the, the nodes, um, make those places and times accessible to women. Um, uh, maybe it's going to take you longer if you only do it um, for an hour uh, every other afternoon. And maybe you're going to have to put in some money for um, making sure that somebody can undertake childcare. Um, but if you don't, you're not going to, 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 to involve the women. And then uh, my final thing, and I could probably go on for a long time, but I'm just going to skip to three, um, is change the language about skills and competencies and contributions to. Um, we have this sort of idea that here are the social skills, and we tend to put these things as soft, as, um, you know, something that everybody could do if only they, you know, had room in their lives, whereas the hard technical skills are... Um, you know, are somehow they are monetarily more valued um, in, 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 the, in the global economies. Um, but uh, unless we change that language and we start changing that mindset, we just will reproduce them in the community networks and when we teach our students and so on. So uh, let's, let's try to change some of the language around uh, skills and contributions um, to uh, what we're thinking about. Yeah, and um, I agree with uh, Sabani and Nick. And for me, in addition to simplification of the language, also simplification of, of the training. So we've seen that uh, in most cases, uh, because of the languaging around tech, and you know this is what an engineer does, so engineer is a very big term. But when it comes to deployment of a network, it can be simplified like the installation process is not something that women are not able to do. Um, in some communities that we see uh, from Africa, it's women who actually do the roofing uh, for, for their houses. So if you can go up to do roofing, what stops you from going up an antenna and, putting an, uh, and installing an equipment? And um, seeing more and more women participating in the deployment process of community networks also helps other women to come up and support. So in the room, for example, we have uh, Immaculate uh, from Bosco, Uganda, who is a young engineer. And because of that, she does a lot of um, training and encouraging more women to come into the community network space. But also from the point of that Nix uh, say that we mostly isolate the older generation in the spaces. One of the women from uh, community network in Zenzeleni. Uh, she's also uh, one of the founders, Mama Sikao, say that I'm really interested to know how to, to deploy a network, but it just seems so, so difficult. And she's an older woman. And so over the time, first she learned how to use a smartphone. Now she's learning how to use a laptop. And when we have gone uh, for the peer exchanges, uh, uh, which are supported uh, through the APC LockNet project in Uganda and also in South Africa, when it came to going out to see uh, the nodes, uh, the network nodes or the deployment process, she did not sit back and say, I am not interested in doing this. She would come and ask questions around what is this and how can I, what does this do? So just Knowing coming from a point of connectivity is we are not bringing solutions to them and saying that this is what you should do with it. Let us engage them from the perspective of what are you interested to do and how can we be able to support you to achieve your agenda. Okay, okay. In the Latin American context, um, one of the, th the mechanisms that has been identified is, the, um, is creating safe, safe spaces for women, spaces where women can talk, can share fears, can share doubts, those can be addressed, and spaces where bond, bonds can be established and, and, and built, uh, you know, with the, responding to different logics. And also at, at the more formal level, so perhaps the establishment of an adoption of some principles, some um, agreements that recognize and activate the participation of women, queer, trans, diverse people in general. There is something that um, 
women participating at the Latin American Summit on Community Networks realize, and is the fact that when the community networks are um, started, the initiative itself is started by women, the chances that those initiatives are going to be much more inclusive of women and diverse people increase, increase those, those chances. So um, I think that tell us um, a, a little bit about the need and the importance of identifying women, queer, trans people, people with diverse gender that are interested or are willing to start networks to, to do so and, and, and for, uh, for all of us to, to be able to support them as much as possible. Uh, but sometimes um, the best way to illustrate um, a situation is by sharing a story. And uh, in this uh, same, um, in one of the uh, peers uh, meetings that the women in Latin America have, have had in the framework of the community networks, um, uh, they, uh, it, it was obviously the, there were women and men in, in, in the room. And uh, some women expressed the interest of installing libre, um, li a, a libre mesh to have a, a libre mesh session. But the response of the men in the room was that it was going to take a lot of time to do that. And it was not going to be possible to, to allow that time to, to happen. So during the evening, the women that were participating in the encounter got together and expressed you know, the discomfort about not having enough space to be able to also explore and, and, and expand the, 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 this, this exercise of exploration of how to engage with technology, because they, were, they, they knew how to do it, they wanted to do it, and, and, and also see what the result is in doing, you know, among different women. So at night they decided to do that, and they installed the Libre Mesh, they brew, and, they, and, and the next day they, they were able to share uh, with the rest of the group. But it, it, I, I'm sharing this story because also in spaces that sometimes women might feel that there is openness and there is a space to allow this exploration and this, uh, to change in this logic of how the, not only women but also men engage with, 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 with technology has to change. Uh, has to change because in those uh, aspects when community networks are based on traditional structure or traditional logics that replicate this idea that uh, technology is not a field for women, you will find also that even if there is a, a community network in place, so there is the need to, to, to work not only in the framework of the traditional telecommunication models, but also in the framework of the alternative models in order to change, change this logic and the dynamic of powers be, be, between the, I mean, inside the communities. I think that the, probably the most important thing I could say right now is that women have to support other women rather than seeing it as a competition. Sometimes women will get a little um, competitive when it comes to different projects. I've seen that in, in my own personal experience. And so I think as role models working across the planet that we just have to support each other to support these projects and come in with as neutral approach as possible and culturally sensitive. Because trying to bring in certain um, perspectives that may not be culturally appropriate at the time could actually create an imbalance that would harm the community more. So it's really waiting to see what you could do to be most effective. Great, thank you. So the last question um, I'm going to ask for now, um, and then I'm going to open it up to, for questions from the floor. Um, I, I would like all the panelists to kind of focus on um, a, a snappy, concrete response to this question, which is always really tough, but um, how do we evaluate connectivity interventions to make sure that they, um, as fully as they can, consider the advantages and disadvantages in terms of gender? And so what I'm asking here is whether you're working in a community network or whether you're working with big telco network operators, um, what are the metrics that we can use? What are the methods we can use to ensure that we're approaching connectivity through an appropriately gendered lens uh, with inclusivity in mind? So let's talk about those metrics and methods that we can use. And um, I'll change it up by starting over here with Jane, if that's OK. I think the best thing I can say is that we have to start doing assessments before we go in. 
working with the community. We find right now that this is something we're going to focus on this year with colleagues and different partners. We've got to take a landscape assessment because if we say we know the baseline, we may have no clue. And so there's no way to get to your method and your metrics unless we're actually taking a look at who's connected, how they're connected, cost, all of that, and gender. And then we go from there and start to create that body of information, working with each other to share that data, and then we can start to do assessments. But we have found that we have not done this well, um, at least on some of our projects and working with some of our partners, and we need to try and bring that rigor in. And that's all I'll say. That's great. And that connects very clearly with something that Josephine said right at the beginning, actually, about um, how a lot of the metrics that we currently have for measuring what connectivity actually even is on the ground come from big network operators or telcos. And so they may not actually reflect the live reality on the ground. So that's a really important point. Um, Valeria? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with Jane, and I think that some taking a stock exercise is needed because community networks have been uh, existing and, and, and working and providing connectivity solutions to the communities. Um, the LockNet project has been running uh, for three, almost three years, so I think that it's, it's moment to do a parenthesis to see what has changed, what is needed, and what is needed in terms of monitoring um, changes, what, what has, uh, how it has evolved, what impact it has caused. So even including the, the impact that uh, facilitating these open spaces for dialogue within the community networks have uh, result on and what the perceptions and what the challenges of participation and engagement are. So I think that's one thing. And um, the research that Nick and Mike Jensen, Nick, 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 Nick Bidwell and Mike Jensen conducted in, in 10 community networks. I, I think they, it, they, they, it provides a very good uh, insights in terms of what is needed uh, to, to, you know, to, to measure the impact of, of, of these initiatives. And then more research is also needed as, as um, Jane was pointing out. So maybe I'll leave it like that. Brilliant, thank you. Josephine. Yeah, I agree with, with all the points. For me, the metric uh, also would be uh, how many women are participating and contributing. Yes. Uh, so to en enrich on yours, it's always a good, it is um, uh, to, to, to uh, think in the broadest sense of what a contribution actually is and what participation is. Um, it's uh, We tend to think of it in rather constrained terms and the other thing that I want to pop into the mix is um, if you stretch if you have enough time um, you have to sort of think about that this technology is not some uh, inert thing that you automatically necessarily take off a shelf we've got more and more um, highly open and flexible technologies um, so it's not just a matter of uh, here's a situation we put this in and this we measure this out, but the engagement um, of people in building and adapting the technology to suit their needs uh, is just as vital, otherwise we just keep on reproducing the wheel. It's actually their engagement in shaping the technology for themselves that uh, we've got to be aware of too. Uh, yes, I completely agree with uh, what Nick says. Uh, is that community's perspective on techno on connectivity needs to be understood because if there is if the, if we don't understand their needs because I have done this in one project of mine that I have just gone ahead we have just gone ahead and decided to connect 25 unconnected villages but we did not understand the connectivity's need of those communities over there like in some communities they wanted wanted a certain thing like a hospital to be built up uh, with the connectivity so that there can be facilitation for telemedicine uh, in that location. But in some villages they wanted a bank. So we did not understand the technologies, uh, the technology, uh, why the connectivity is needed by the community. And I think that is very necessary before we, any, before, before we actually undertake the journey of connecting some of the communities. Okay, great. Um, 
I think there's room to expand on that, so we'll see where the questions take us. But um, are there any questions from anyone in the room? Um, yes, over here. It's, it's the big oh, okay. question, yes. yeah. Okay, <laughs> technology. Uh, my name is Paul Rowney, uh, and I'm a supporter of community networks. I, I, I believe that uh, community networks are the only way forward if we want to make a difference and we want to connect communities today. Uh, but community networks, they face an uphill battle in scaling. And this is not, in my opinion, a technology uh, or a capacity perspective, but it's unfavorable regulatory frameworks that often hinder uh, community networks from actually expanding, growing, etc. cetera. Um, there is, other, other than regular frameworks, you know, we have a lack of understanding with our governments. And in some countries, we have dominant MNOs that uh, sort of force the thought processes. In my country in particular, you know, our regulator frustrates community networks, is hostile towards TV white space, is hostile towards open GSM. Um, so, you know, my, my question really is, uh, how do we deal with this challenge? How do we energize, educate our regulators to think out of the box? Because it was mentioned by Jane earlier, we, we, we can't do business as usual if we want to connect those remaining disconnected. We need our regulatory bodies, we need our governments to start thinking differently and acting differently. Uh, we, we also need to encourage the ITU to be a bit more forceful on these discussions. Uh, we, I think most of us genuinely accept that it will not be the MNOs that are connecting the communities, the last mile communities, but it will be the community networks. But if we don't have an environment that enables the community networks to thrive, we're going to miss this opportunity. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks for that question. And I'm going to add on to that how... Um, Let's, let's think as well about how we reform regulatory frameworks and have that dialogue while including uh, gendered and inclusivity perspective in that conversation. It links to a lot of things the panelists have mentioned about how difficult it is to have that conversation at that policy level and how many forms of invisibility and exclusion operate at that, at that level. So would any of the, um, would any of the panelists uh, particularly like to jump in and, and tackle this question on the regulatory front? Yeah, Jane. Um, yeah, I've helped create regulators, so I, I'm I'm fully aware, and I can yeah, I feel your pain on the on the regulatory policy side. Um, you can't give up. You have to work together. We can't say that the UN doesn't have a role. They do, and I'm with you. We had our we had a very difficult time at a treaty conference last year, and now the tide has changed remarkably. <coughs> from a conversation where we were being accused of supporting pirate and terrorist networks, which I had to sit there with so many governments and say, you knew me from before. I, I was here 20 years ago. How is it that this is something you think that I would be supporting? But the bottom line is that there has to be this change. And we're seeing the change slowly. But we can't give up on that. We have to work together with the UN. And I, Doreen Bogdan, who's a new, um, director of the ITUD, the development sector, there are three sectors in the ITU, is a champion of community networks. She's, many of us have been talking to her from APC to ISOC about the importance of working with the ITU, and we actually have a project with the ITUD America's office to do some work, to look at a toolkit, and again, it cannot be alone. It has to be with all our colleagues, with community networks leading as well, because they have the on-the-ground experience. But we have to get that data out there and work together to amplify it through social media, through talking to governments. I've been blasted by governments all my career when I was even in government and now, so you just have to keep at it. And you can't, you do have to respect their position and they have, and you can hope that they would respect yours, but we're coming at it from a more agile mindset um, of change. And so often they're gonna be defensive. And so it's very important to work with the governments to see that the, it's possible some companies are coming around the bigger companies to change, but in other places it's going to be harder. So universal service is changing. There's a great report from A4AI, which has a gender focus about universal service. 
And if you want to talk about universal service, happy to do that, 20-something years old, but it's changing. And we have to force the change with good examples. Latin America, quite frankly, has some of the best examples we're seeing right now. But the regulator from Papua New Guinea is working with one of my colleagues from Pakistan. They're looking at universal service funding for a community network in a small island country that hadn't even thought about this uh, five years ago. But they're willing because they trust us. They trust some of the other partners in the region. Uh, we help them with an internet exchange point. So we have to take that technical trust neutrality and see what we can do to build on that. And that's something that we can do together. And APC has a great training program they're working on. So I'm not going to speak to that, but I think you should talk to APC about what they're doing. OK, I think that um, uh, in this field, obviously, I think we have to keep insisting in the fact that the the dominant logic that a regulation should be done for these large national operators has to be uh, um, unpacked more. We, we cannot stop doing that. And I think part of the solution also passes for uh, providing a specific solutions, a specific measures that can be taken uh, to address the various aspects of the regulatory um, uh, field, like licensing, taxing, access to uh, a spectrum, uh, and so on. So to provide specific solutions and to show that those solutions are not going to replace the, 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 the commercial model, but actually that the, uh, the, 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 the proposals or the ideas that we are trying to move forward <laughs> goes towards creating a, 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 a environment in which the different models can coexist and can coexist in a way that makes them legal. That has, it's, it's just shocking to hear that some of the community networks are, are put the label of, you know, terrorists, illegal. So uh, it is it, the same what happened with the community uh, radio and media, that they were for many, many decades put in the, you know, in, in, in this uh, feel and in the side of existing in illegality. So I think we have to combat combat that by providing very viable solutions and proving that it is possible for different models to coexist uh, in a in a in a way that allows them to uh, uh, flourish, to be sustainable, and to provide specific solutions depending on the needs of that particular context. Anyone from the other side of the lectern would like to weigh in or no? Okay. Um, I think there is another question possibly from online. Yes. A comment from Johannesburg Remote Hub on gender inclusion. It is better to provide theory and practical skills for gender inclusion as opposed to just training on site deployments and installations. Women, both young and old, are interested in community networks and developing new local content. So training is very paramount in enabling inc inclusion also of disabled people based on our experience on ISOC South Africa Houghton chapter. Women also can play an important role in the administration of community networks, but they need mentoring to ease their entire experience and integration. I don't know if. Okay, um, it's an important intervention, I think. Would anybody like to respond to that? Nick, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, on the mentoring aspect, um, and uh, I think Jane mentioned uh, earlier about the, the, the solidarity aspect. Um, so it's, it's not just women uh, in the villages and uh, in the townships, it's, it's all of us. Um, at all levels, um, and um, finding a, a, a mode that balance what the um, what the participant said. So, training a mentorship balanced with theory and critique, and finding a kind of middle ground um, where both uh, <coughs> feminist critique, for instance, and decolonial critique can work together with. Um, uh, solidarity across all marginalized groups. Um, not an easy thing, but something to aspire to. Josephine, do you want to say anything? No. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, over here, great, yes. Thank you. 
Alberto Diaz is my name, um, co-founder from Hedera. We, we develop um, digital solutions for sustainable development, and we're experts in impact monitoring at household level. And we have encountered a, a big, big challenge in the fact that um, people, um, households, communities uh, exist in two levels, in real life and in, in the digital life. And those that do not exist in the digital life should become visible. And this is what uh, the SDGs reports have um, named data gap. There's a data gap between that what we know from different tools to, to collect information, big data and so on, and that that is actually happen locally. So in regards to this data gap, what do you believe is a um, realistic approach to minimize this, this big challenge? Thank you. I'm going to wander into something that I'm not an expert in, but I've heard more about. And Matt Rantan, and if he's still here, may be able to, he left. Tribal communities are highly sensitive, at least in North America, to data gathering. It's been used against them. So you'd have to really talk to tribal authorities more if you're looking at a broader scope of assessment, because it could harm the communities you want to document. So um, I would say that's the best I can do, and I will turn it over to other people who are more expert, but there's a lot of care you have to take when you're trying to do an assessment like that. Yeah, does anyone on the panel have some insights about w what works, what, what actually does? Yeah. Okay. I'm Chasetori from uh, Georgia Mountain Community Networks. Uh, I have a question about the silver surfers. Uh, because in Georgia, maybe in your countries also, we have mostly people that are uh, older than 60, 65 sometimes, and they have real challenges. It's not related to the gender, it's related to the age. Do we have some experience how we can uh, training, train, I don't know, what can we do with these people, how we can help them to uh, stay online? So that taps into some of the conversations about age um, that came up earlier on the panel. Um, would anyone, maybe Sarbani, or um, like to talk about uh, getting people online, keeping people online in the community? Is that? Yeah. Um, in our villages, uh, young women as well as older women, mostly older women, um, they come on to share their local knowledge. So the, lo the, no the knowledge that they have uh, on the various aspects, the various things in the community, they share that knowledge. So uh, in the form of uh, audio and video. So it's mostly to do with audio because they don't, they can't, they, their hands shake when they take any video. But uh, they usually are trained for audio so that they can uh, ask, uh, they can go, so they, uh, in the, on the phone, we, uh, we ask them to uh, collect uh, audio, um, or they themselves say about the various things uh, that their community has. So that's how the women are there, but it's all offline because our communities, um, certain part of the knowledge, because these are indigenous communities, so certain part of the knowledge they don't want to uh, go onto the internet. They want it to be within the community and they want to collect as much as possible. And some part of it can go into the internet, that's what. So we seek their permission that what part of it should go into the internet and what shall remain within the community. So that's it. That's great, yeah. Nick, do you wanna add to that? Um, so generally, um, data around the world suggests that the um, the, 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 quick, the quick fix to that is staying in touch with your kids, um, your migrant family, um, and the more fun that you can make that, um, uh, the better. Uh, so, so staying in touch with people you love is the biggest driver for, for 
uh, older populations. Um, but there's also an issue, and I think it touches a little bit to the data gap as well, um, which is the um, how you balance uh, the support by the kids. Um, so a dependent, so, so if your kids live in the home, um, many places, um, people, especially older women, were becoming very isolated because uh, the, the child, uh, the younger person that helped them maintain contact with their migrant husband was ill and all of a sudden they had no ability to communicate with their husband and, th and this happened in a few communities i heard many stories about this so um the relationship between uh relying on your younger family men members and dependency on them for your banking for your uh buying your airtime for even communicating with your own loved ones um is a sensitivity that we have to bear in mind Great, and um, oh, sorry, Josephine, did you? No, okay. Um, I think also on the theme of data gaps, Valeria, did yes. you want to? Yes, in, in response to the data-related question, I think one of the approaches that we, or through the lenses that we, we, we are, I mean, looking at the community networks uh, dynamics is the, the rights-based approach. And in relation to data, I, I think that always, but in particular, um, uh, in the context of community networks, it is really important to uh, adopt this approach and to look at data through the lens of, of, of human rights. Because obviously community networks has a lot to do with exercising the right for self-determination, and that applies to data. So in uh, whatever the purpose for the data collection and analysis is, it, whether it is with the research purposes or with other purposes, I think it is really important to keep in mind what is the purpose of using the data. So principles of necessity, proportionality, and so on, I, th I think have to apply particularly to this context and, and, and be really mindful that um, uh, the, the, the context in which community networks exist is also a context that many of us believe is going to strengthen the exercise of human rights and then for the communities being able to exercise control and to control the, 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 the data that is gathered are around uh, their existence, their lives, uh, is, is quite important. So to, to, for them to have control and to consent whatever use is going to be made of that data. So I know that we have a couple more questions in the audience, but I'm afraid we're getting very close to the end of the session now. And um, I'm just going to close with one final question. So panelists, just really quickly, could you just raise your hand if you will be sticking around for at least the rest of today so people can find you if they'd like to ask questions? Who will be around? Everyone, that's great. So you can come and find us later if you've still got outstanding questions. Um, but my last question, which I'd just like a very quick kind of one sentence response from each panelist on relates to that, um, that, that tension that I discussed earlier at the very beginning of the panel between the work that we all do in grassroots communities with, um, in terms of organizing and network building and, uh, and the work that we have to do at the policy level in order to ensure that community networks can actually thrive and that, um, and that individual communities that don't have connectivity can get online on their own terms. And so what I'd like us to do is uh, each kind of summarize one thing that you would like to say to community networks or kind of this growing community network movement on the issue of inclusivity. What can we be doing better? And one thing that you would like to say broader, uh, to, to, sorry, one thing you would like to say to the broader community of network operators um, and even MNOs and other actors in this space uh, in general about about inclusivity based on your experiences. So at those two levels, the community level and the, and the broader multinational level, what would you like to say on this issue? And let's start again down here with Sarbani, if that's okay. Okay, so I would like to say that uh, make it, uh, make, um, so at the community level, this should happen that uh, the telecom operators should enable the connectivity over there because like for example in our villages what we see is that Geota is standing there for two and a half years, three years and there is no connectivity over there. So, so I think um, just make it accessible to the people over there so that 
people can, uh, local ISPs or the local internet service providers, communities can form as cooperatives and they can take the connectivity to their village. You don't even have to take it to the village by, by uh, so you can enable some franchisee model for the local ISP or the local ISP buys the bulk bandwidth and enables it to the last mile. So I think make it more accessible, that is, uh, that is something that the community networks would need. Um, to community networks, technology can be changed and you can change it. It can be about you that drives that change. Um, and to policymakers, unsettle your so-called gold standards of assessing impact. If you want to carry on having one-page elevator pitches, you will carry on going on elevators. To grassroots, um, uh, to fellow community networks, uh, let's create uh, spaces where women can ex freely express themselves, uh, learn, and also contribute. At uh, the uh, bigger level, I think national and global level, let's strengthen the capacity of grassroots communities to participate and contribute. Yeah, to community networks, obviously, to. Um, uh, keep creating spaces for women to be able to express themselves, to be part of the solution in a meaningful, integral way, and uh, for regulators to understand that we are not going to be able to achieve development goals without really changing, and, uh, changing the mindset and the logic uh, through which regulatory and policy solutions are conceived and implemented. So we need really a, a change, a change in the logic. I think I'd simply say to community networks, um, there are many of us here that can provide uh, connections to each other because it's the human networks that build the net nets, as I say online on Twitter. But to policymakers and other colleagues in the connectivity space, we'll work on this together. There are ways to make this work. Wonderful, and on that note, a huge thank you to our great panelists uh, in this session, and a thank you to all of you for attending and listening uh, intently, and let's continue the conversation after this. Thanks very much. Thank a nice photo after I edited it. Are we the photo? Yes. Sal? Jane? Um, no, outside. <laughs> uh, Hello, what? Oh, yeah. We stand around here so that we can.
But it's, it's Um, welcome to uh, a session which is basically based on an IGF pilot that is being conducted at this point in time on the deployment of internet standards for a safer internet. So what we're going to do in this pilot is that we have researched reasons on the lack of deployment and successful stories about deployment around the globe. And we came up with five recommendations that may actually speed up the deployment if they were followed up. So the concept of this session is, is that we're going to break out into five groups. And those five groups will be led by a moderator and there will be a rapporteur to mention what you are actually uh, suggesting on recommendations. There are five, as I said, concept recommendations. The first one is to create a positive business case for the deployment of internet standards. And, oh, that's not in green armor bag. All right, the, we have Gerben Klein-Baltink. Please raise your hand over there. And he's a rapporteur assisted by Martin Simon. And if you're interested in that discussion, please step over to Gerben and we will find a place in this room or somewhere else to discuss. The second is if the deploy internet standards successfully, it has to be incorporated in law that is regulated actively and that will be moderated by Mark Carvel and he is assisted by Martin Porter sitting next to me. The third one is to deploy standards successfully, they need to be built into products by design or default. And I haven't seen Pablo yet, so he is going to be replaced by Bart 
Knubben of the Dutch Platform Internet Standards, and he will be assisted by Thijs Koops. The fourth one is to make standards and their effect on internet security better known, and that is led by Arda Gerkens, and she's assisted by, by Roos Kist. And the fifth one is to make ICT and internet products more secure, but that will go through education. And that is led by Mark van Zarek, and he's assisted by Alke Pauls, and we're going to make a challenge there. There are people online, and they will participate in that part of the session. So this is the plan. We're going to bre break it up. <coughs> Your recommendations is, is not about getting consensus, but getting ideas out. So please, please speak your mind freely about your ideas on this specific topic with the moderator, and they will find their place into the report. So there's no need that it's going to be 